11, 37. Um, and we're going to get there in a little bit. I missed you guys last week. Um, we missed you. I um, got the bug. My kids gave me the, the diseases. <laughs> they were like, you know what, Dad? We're about to leave school. Let's give you one more. Yeah. You know, one more. Happy Father's Day. We love you. Bam. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I, I feel so much better. And, um, yeah, I missed you guys a lot. It, I uh, was eager to bring this message last week, but you guys get it today. Um, the last time I spoke... I spoke about uh, screen time. Um, how many of you guys were here for that? Like screen time, how a Christian should, uh, how a Christian should approach our time and our screen time. Because now time is there's there's different categories for time now. There was just time where you would get to a stoplight and you were just at a stoplight, <laughs> right? Who remembers that? As a kid, your kids you'd pull up to a stoplight and you, there was nothing to do. So you just sat there and waited, and you weren't on your phone or your Game Boy. You were just in a car. <laughs> and now it's we've got podcasts, and we've got YouTube, and we've got every single thing in the world in our pocket all the time. Like, literally, this is the first generation ever to have the ability to contact somebody on the other side of the planet in a blink of an eye. How, how crazy is that? Um, and so I kind of just walked you guys through that, that process of we need to have boundaries and rules of life for our screen time and for our time. And so I talked about um, how you'll either become bored to death in this life or you'll be bored into depth. That like either boredom will happen to you or you get into boredom and you let it happen to you and you get deeper. Um, John Mark Homer, he said this, he said, we must arrange our days, our morning routines, our, our daily habits, our schedules, our budgets, our relationships, the entire web of our lives, so that we are deeply enjoying everyday life with God. This will require most of us not only to arrange our days, but also to rearrange our days from the hurry, digital addiction, and chronic exhaustion that we've been conditioned to believe is normal, when in reality, it's truly insane." Um, so I talked about a solution to that being Sabbath and practicing Sabbath to remove yourself from phones, from your technology, and to just be with your family, to delight in one another, to look at your children and not go back and forth between this and your children. Um, and just how, like, the, the beauty that that, that, that uh, does to a person, um, even in what we've been doing for the last few weeks of practicing Sabbath, it is changing me. Um, and that's the thing is Sabbath was a gift before it was a command. Amen. When God gave us Sabbath, it was to create life in us. It wasn't just to create a rule. It was literally to say, hey, this life will make you go faster. You need to slow down. Um, and they actually said but when they invented the clock, um, it was during the time, the, the clock was not invented, but during the time of Nixon, they expected that by now, today, we would be working three to four hours a day, and that technology would fix everything else, that we would just be able to work three to four hours a day and then just rest the rest of the day. But what happens? We are consumers. We need more, right? And so it wasn't just enough to get things taken off our plate. We added more to our plate because now efficiency looks like let's do some more, right? Um, and and that's, that's the world we're living in right now, that we, we really need to approach life with a, there's a counterculture thing happening in, this, in, in our church and the church, really. Like, there has to be a counterculture. If the world is getting faster, we should be getting slower. And that's not small-minded. You might say, oh, that's so small-minded. Oh, that's so, you know, it's not. There's actually a slowness that needs to be found in the heart of people. Because Jesus said, when you come to me, my yoke is what? It's easy and it's light. Why? Because he's not carrying and juggling the consumeristic, materialistic idea, ideology of the day right now. Right? Yeah. So slow down. So if you didn't listen to that message, go back, listen to it. I think it's really, really important. Now I'm going to tell you a story and very much like last week, I need you guys to put everything down that's like throwable, okay? If you can throw something at me, you're going to want to throw it at me, okay? So put it away. Put it away from you. 
Do not stone the pastor, okay? Um, Because you're not going to like me after I tell this story, (laughs) or at least you're going to think less of me, but I've grown out of it, okay? Were you good? Okay, I'm about to tell you a, a doozy of a story, okay? So I just need you to buckle up and get ready. So when Lydia and I got married, uh, we moved into this little rental house, and um, we, Lydia was pregnant with Grayson at the time, and we had very little money. We made like $25,000 um, in a year in Utah where the median, like the, the regular income in, in uh, Utah is like 70 grand at that time. It's probably, probably 100 grand, I would think now. Um, it's, it's a lot. Um, your, Gina's laughing because her daughter just moved to Utah. She's about to find out. It's expensive. Um, and we were there just scraping by. Um, and we moved into this house. We had very little furniture and we're making not very much money. And I am a brand new husband, brand new almost father. And I just, I had this great idea. I'm like, okay, the baby's coming. You know what we need in this house? We need a TV. Okay, we need this TV, put it on the wall. It's going to be amazing. Here's the problem, though. The whole time, Lydia's like, I would really like a rocker. Or, I, I know, can I tell the story? Are we going to, you're going to be okay? It's Father's Day. This is my day, okay? This story's going to be my, ver- I'm just kidding. It's, oh, wow, all the women ready to, I told you to put the things down. So, we had no furniture, no furniture in the house at all. Um, we had our bed, and that's it. Um, so I don't know what 19-year-old Ethan was thinking, but 19-year-old th- Ethan thought he was very wise. And he thought, you know, let's go on Craigslist. I got a, we got a Christmas bonus. We get this money. Let's go buy a TV. And I bring this TV home. I put it right up on the wall, and then I sit on the floor. <laughs> just sitting on the floor, just Indian style playing Call of Duty, just like, this is the best. We're living our best life right now. This is amazing. And meanwhile, Lydia is like five months pregnant. We're about to have Grayson, how many? Eight months pregnant. Okay, whatever. Eight months pregnant. (laughs) Get off your high horse. No, I'm kidding. So (laughs) we're good. We love each other. Um, So I just think this is a great idea. We'll have entertainment. This is going to be great. Um, So Lydia... I know, this is terrible. Lydia's like, okay, I need, we need a couch. So she goes on Craigslist because I spend all of our money on a TV. She goes on Craigslist and she goes finds a couch from somebody whose roommate was a drug addict and she left or got arrested or something like that and she was selling all their stuff. Um, we didn't really know that until really after the fact. But she goes and picks up this big green couch, and we're like, sweet, $29 couch. In what scenario does a $29 couch make sense? Sometimes it does. This time it felt too good to be true, and it was. So we got this couch, we brought it home, and one day I'm at work, and I'm working away, and, and then she goes, she sends me this picture, and it's, she's like, hey, I found something in the couch. I'm like, what is it? She's like, it's this plastic bag full of like flour. And I'm like, that ain't flour. Yeah, so we call it, I'm not even gonna bring it up. because Anyway, so we found drug paraphernalia in this couch and I'm like, flush it immediately. And our neighbor was a cop, so I was like, don't tell John because he's gonna be like, you're out here living. Yeah, I was like, don't do, do that. Don't tell John, flush it, just get rid of it, you know? So anyways, long story short, I realized after this, like, I'm like, man, um, it was probably five months later or something, and then Grayson comes along, and I'm, and all of a sudden we're like, we don't have, well, we got our drug couch, but we don't have a rocker or anything like that. And again, you guys are going to think little of me right now, right? You're like, you're the worst, Ethan. Here's what money does to us. Money, for me, revealed my greatest love in that moment. Money revealed to me, I value entertainment, I value the the TV, I value what that can give me over the needs of my wife. Yeah, it stinks for me too (laughs) to think that. And in that moment, it was like, it, probably six months later, it was like I started to have my child and also I'm, I'm walking in this role of I care for you and I care for my son. And really the nature of being a father is being selfless, right? 
And many of us, including myself, the struggle of walking into fatherhood was dying to myself because now these people were supposed to matter more than me. Um, and here's what happened is money is the great revealer. Money is the great revealer of like what's going on in you. And here's the deal. If you've been coming to the clearing, how often do I speak on money? Never. I speak like one time a year. This is the one time a year. But here's the deal. So like one time a year, I talk on money usually. Um, and, but I, I've lately been convicted by this because 40% of what Jesus talks about in the Bible is about money. 40% of what he talks about, money. Why? So here's the question. Why, why is money, why does money get a hold on us and we start doing things like buying TVs when we should be caring for our beautiful wife and our child? What, right, and maybe it's just me, okay. But <laughs> there's times where like money's just the great revealer. It's the great revealer of selfishness. It's the great revealer of things going on in our heart. It's, it reveals like a, just an x-ray of who you are. And I, I realized that this, this moment of realizing that my affections for my needs, my wants, and my entertainment, it outweighed my greatest loves. It, like, it, it skewed what was going on inside of me. And I think the reason why Jesus spoke so much on money is because money tricks us and it actually warps us and it gets into us more than we would like to think or need. Um, more, more than we'd like to think, yeah? yeah. Um, I think the reason why Jesus spoke on it so often is because it's easy to know when you're in sin usually. Like it's easy to know if you're a liar, if you're in sexual sin, if you're uh, uh, manipulating, gossiping, doing things that you just know you shouldn't be doing. Yeah, you, usually those things are really obvious. It's pretty obvious if you're a murderer, Right? So he's not talking about murder all the time because it's really obvious when you do that, right? Or the same if, if, if you're somebody who gossips all the time, it's pretty obvious to yourself that you gossip a lot. Why? Because every time you get around people, you can't help but talk about other people, right? So Jesus talks about money because money is the thing that we all have in common that's either controlling us or we're controlling it. And so that's why he talks so much about it. It's not to, to be um, a pastor or to be a rabbi or something like that and to just manipulate people into giving money. That's not why he talks about it. He talks about it because when money gets us and takes over us, we can't be generous. It takes away the ability to be generous. And so I didn't realize I didn't have a rule of life for my finances, that my finances Everything that's going on in my wallet is a reflection of what's happening in Ethan. Okay? That my money actually reflects what I value most. And if I went onto my Amazon account or into my checking account and I watched where my money is going, it reveals all the things going on inside of me. It reveals my diets, my, my loves, my entertainments, the books I like to read. It reveals every single thing. I'm subscribed to life. And if you and I are subscribed to all these different services in life, we should know what am I most subscribed to. Amen? I know this is like not a fun message to hear on Father's Day, but here's the deal. As fathers, we need to lead way better than 19-year-old Ethan. <laughs> right? Um, and so in a world of self-care, we are taught that caring for oneself is the peak of emotional health and authenticity. Though self-care is good and even needed, it has become intrusive in how it has made most of culture, and yes, even Christian culture, focused on their own desires and goals first and foremost, before even considering the needs of others. Like if you go on Insta, uh, Instagram and you go on to these different influencers' pages, they're like, do it for you, do it for you. I didn't do it for you, I did it for me, right? And it's this very like, like me, 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 individualism culture. And here's the deal, like working out and doing things for yourself to refresh yourself, it's not evil. It is evil when it becomes the primary thing over the needs of others. Okay. So, you're, so what Ethan, what I'm saying right now is not don't take care of yourself. What I'm saying is if your primary pinnacle mountaintop experience of life is you, 
you have utterly missed it. Utterly missed it. If all my life is unto me, I am God now. Come on, people. I am the idol. It's me. Who do I worship most? Me. What do I care about the most? Me. If my whole happiness, my whole world, and every bit of money that I have revolves around my goals, who I, who I am, what I want to become, the trip I want to go on, if it's all about me, that's a scary place to be. Um, yeah. You good? I'm not here to be, here's the deal, guys. I'm not here to beat anybody up, okay? That's like this, this whole thing. I know this can turn into that. I'm not here to do that. What I'm doing is calling you into the freedom and liberty that happens when, you, when money gets in your hand and it doesn't control you. Um, a recent Barna study in a statistic found that only 5 to 10% of Christians attending church actually faithfully give and practice generosity. Only 5 to 10%. And that's actually a pretty accurate stat if we're being real and honest. Typically, the things that the church does and the things that a church has and everything like that, it's representing 5 to 10% of people in a church that are giving. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. And here's the deal. When we give, it's an act of sacrifice. It's an act of letting go. It's an act of, of moving away from something controlling you into offering it up for somebody else, which is the hardest part about money. Because here's the deal. If you have $200, what is that? You hold that $200 up, and that $200 has a name, right? That, the name is a whole bunch of Starbucks coffees, you know, an Amazon gift card. It has, you know, new coffee subscription. It's got, you know, the makeup boxes that come in the mail, and you get different makeup all the time, right? It's it's, it's got all of that written on it. When you hold your money up in there, you look at it, right? It's like, man, these are a brand new pair of Jordans. Let's go praise the Lord, right? I'm the sneaker guy, so you know me. But that's what happens. When we get money, we put a name on it. We're like, this money is for X, right? Yeah. And Jesus, he says something about, about uh, money and giving here. And I love this. It's actually from the, the complete Jewish Bible translation. It's Acts 20, 35. It says, in everything, I have given you an example of how by working hard like this, you must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Yeshua himself. This is what Jesus says. There is more happiness in giving than receiving. There's more happiness in giving away than receiving. So what does that tell me? That tells me the question in this life isn't what or how much should I be giving? It's how badly do you want deep joy in your life? Come on. The question, she's like, yes, he, she, la, right? The question isn't how much do I give? It's how badly do I want joy? And here's the thing. We look at it as, well, it's going to, I don't, how much is, how much should I give? I don't know if I should or shouldn't. And the reason why we're asking that is we're so concerned about the cost. What's it going to cost you if you don't? Because Jesus said that you'll be more happy by giving than if you hold it. And here's the thing. This, this is not just a theological principle. This is statistically true. If you go into the statistics in America, the people who give the most are the happiest. Okay, keep going here. <laughs> Ugh. Money is something we will never stop needing and wanting, but I think culture actually got it right. I think culture got it right when they said, more, more money, more problems, <laughs> right? More money, more problems. But here's the deal. The more here is what we need to land on. What if more money is only more problems because we just need more, 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 more? What if that's the problem? What if, what if it's consumerism and materialism of when I have money, I need more? And here's the deal. In our culture, Addition is way better than subtraction. You never hear somebody walk up to you and go, hey, guess what? I gave my tractor away, <laughs> right? No, you hear, you know, the person, I just got a brand new tractor, let's go. Brand new Apple Watch, brand new iPhone, 
right? You typically, and all the advertisers are doing this to you, is when you watch advertisements, just watch this. If you watch them, they're portraying you at your most happiest by adding this product to your life. That if I get this and add it to my life, I will be happier. That's what they're selling you, is happiness. But Jesus says subtraction makes you actually happier, not addition. And so we live in a world where addition is praised and subtraction is looked down on. But the problem is money has a hold on us more than we have a hold on it. Money has the power to bring freedom and security while also the power to, be, to rear its beautiful intoxicating head and hypnotize us with the grand story of more, more, more. It's, it's a beautiful thing that actually can do beautiful things, but it also is intoxicating and hypnotizing and it will lure you away into more. Money is the great revealer. It's not enough to ask Jesus what he would do with money. We have to ask him, what would Jesus do with his money if he were me? If Jesus were me, how would he spend his money? You're like, I don't want to ask that question. (laughs) Jesus isn't a stay-at-home mom. Jesus isn't a white, you know, a white man working in a white-collar business. You know, he didn't have kids. He doesn't know. No, but what if... Jesus lives in you, and how would you, how would he, if he were you, spend his money? How would he spend his money if he was a business owner? And here's the deal with God, generosity is non-negotiable. God is a generous God. When God does something, he welcomes us into his character, into his nature. Okay? When God loves, he's not just saying, oh, I love to love. You don't need to do it, though. No, when he exhibits love, he's welcoming you, welcoming you into that love. When he exhibits generosity, he's welcoming you, welcoming you into that generosity. He expects fully that we walk in the same character and nature as him. And here's the deal. Some of you in this room, you're like, I don't even follow Jesus. I'm not even talking to you right now. I'm talking to the people who say, I follow Jesus. So for everybody else who you're like, I don't follow Jesus, then that's fine. This is going to be boring for you. Everybody else, if you say, I am a follower of Jesus, he expects you to walk as he walks in generosity. You're like, well, I don't see anything here where Jesus is given money. God gave his son. How generous is that to bankrupt heaven of its only son? It says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Galatians 1, 3 through 4, it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. 2 Corinthians 8, 8 through 15, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor so that by his poverty, we might become rich. Dude, come on. But we've heard a gospel in America that says, if you give, you will be blessed. Give so you can be blessed, so you can climb the corporate ladder of Christianity. It's not real. You don't give to be blessed. You give to be a blessing, right? Like you give because out of the innermost parts of you, you're like, I'm following a man who was abundantly rich and yet he became poor. That Jesus said that the son of man has no place to lay his head. He had a home and he became homeless. I don't, I don't see it, Ethan. Well, stay with me here. John Mark Homer, he says this, generosity is one of the most joyful practices at the heart of the Trinitarian community. That's the Trinity of God we call God, is an outflow of generous, self-giving, forgiving love. In the gospel itself, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and the son in return gave the spirit. When we give our money, our resources, our time and love, we get to participate in the divine outflow of love. And as Ronald Rollheiser said it, when you act like God, you get to feel like God. Oh my goodness. 
Do you think God's worried right now? Do you think God's anxious right now? Do you think he's wondering where his peace went? Where did my peace go? Come on. What if giving the Lord our money, what if giving him our time, our resources, what if giving it away has the ability to step into the divine love, the divine peace, the, to leave our anxiety away, uh, apart from us because we're stepping into trust? It's trust. In giving, we become like God himself, where he gives. We become a generous, benevolent, and joyful person who is not gripping tightly the money in our pockets, but gripping tightly the heart of God. When God shows himself generous, it's not a cute show and tell. He's not just like, here, I was generous for you. He's ushering us into and welcoming us into a, a family of giving. Yep. You guys are real quiet. We're okay? Okay. The best kind of generosity costs us something. In giving away our money, we give away the part of ourselves that is controlled by money. That was good. Generosity is the deconstruction of the selfish man and the construction of the obedient, self-controlled man. It's the deconstruction of your most anxious, most untrusting person in the construction of someone who is self-controlled and disciplined. Come on, Jesus. So the question isn't, what is it going to cost me if I give? The question is, what is it going to cost me if I don't become a generous person? Where you put your resources is where you put your heart. What did Ethan, what did I pass 19-year-old Ethan? I say, what did Ethan do, like in third person? Because I'm like, that's not me anymore. <laughs> I'm trying to disconnect myself from that, right? What I did was I put the greatest resources of my love on a TV, I didn't put it on my wife and my child, right? Humbling and just gross to even say out loud, but it's true. How often do we see people in need, but we're like, no, you know what? My 401k could use more of a bump. Like, oh, you know what? Like, oh, I could tithe, but I really like Starbucks. Okay, nobody relates to that, huh? No, no. <laughs> Bro, you need a mortgage for Starbucks nowadays. $8 for a Trenta? Venti, whatever. I mean, eight, ten, like $8 for a drink. A drink. You're going to down that thing in five minutes. $8. Okay, sorry, Starbucks. We'll get through it. Katie Thompson, she said something a few weeks ago. She said, she was speaking about humility, and she said, humility means you bring a proper assessment to every situation of who you and others and of who God is. That you bring a proper assessment to, to the value of who you are, who I am, and who God is. That's what humility does. Why is it so hard for us to give money away? Because we are really proud. We think really highly of ourselves. If we're being really real and honest, can we be real and honest? We think highly of ourselves and we think little of God and men, women. You know what I'm saying? Human. We're okay? I don't like the pronouns you used, Ethan. Here we go. <laughs> Stay away. Giving is a way to keep ourselves humble by properly assessing both God and others around us being above us. When we fail to give, it is because we have failed to properly assess both man and God and have lifted ourselves above all. So what are the means that God asks us to join in his generosity? The first thing is tithe. If you don't know what tithe is, I heard the statistic this week, it's crazy. Uh, the, the statistic is that 43% of Christians can say what tithe is in America. The other percentage, have they don't even know how to describe tithe. And so if you're in this room, you're like, I don't know what tithe is. I'm not beating you up. It just means we have to talk about it more. Like we actually need an education on this. If this is a core principle of Christianity, tithe is giving God 10% of your income back to him. 
And we have Christians, they say, we're going to get into it. We have Christians who are like, that's an old covenant principle. The new covenant doesn't talk about tithing. No, it totally does. 100% does. We're going to get into it. Tithing is giving God the first fruits back to him. Okay? The first fruits. That means when I get paid, like everybody here, you understand, I don't get paid here. Okay? I don't take a check. I've never taken a check from the clearing. When I get paid, the first 10% of my paycheck goes boom. I open up the church center app, do, 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 boom, enter, gone. 10%, it's given. That's what tithe is. It's, I take in that income and guess what I do? I go, Lord, this was yours to begin with. It didn't belong to me, it's yours. You're like, Ethan, that doesn't make sense. You worked for that. I did work for that, but guess who got me in this spot? Guess who got me in the door where I'm working? Okay? You, some of you have heard my testimony. I shouldn't even have the job I have because I don't have the degree that I needed to be in this job. But I have the job. Why? Because Jesus kicked the door open for me. So for me to get paid and then go, oh, you know what, Jesus, it's just too much. You don't need it. You got gold streets. <laughs> right? God's not hurting for money. Right? Right? but he's hurting for your heart and that's part of it. You get paid and he's like, I'd like your heart and the money is usually the closest thing to our hearts and that's why if there is feelings in this room right now that are negative, it's because it's, we're talking about your heart. If you're sitting in this room, you're like, I don't like that Ethan's talking about money. It's because I'm talking about your heart. Come on, if you walk out of this room and you want to criticize this message, it's because I was talking about your heart. I'm talking about my heart. I'm talking about consumerism in our world where everything is telling me I need more and Jesus is saying, you'll be happy if you give it away. And I can say that that's true. So tithe is not earning God's love either. It's surrendering our trust over to his love. Okay, we don't tithe to make God happy. We don't tithe to make us like us more. Right? We don't tithe to make him like, oh yeah, here you go, stamp of approval. We don't do that. We tithe because we love him. It's an, it's an expression of our worship. Tithing is a defiant and rebellious shout in opposition to the world that we will trust in the Lord and give to him what he first gave us. Yeah? People would argue that in the New Testament that it did away with tithe, but if you read in Matthew 5, 17, and you go all the way through Matthew 5, 17, Watch what Jesus does. They're like, oh, like Christians nowadays, they'll be like, oh, well, the tithe, we don't need a tithe. Jesus said not, he didn't, he didn't ever talk about tithe. No, the tithe was part of the law. And what did Jesus do? He said, I'm going to fulfill it. You heard it said, if you look at a woman, right? He says, you heard it said that if you go and commit adultery, this is what happens. I tell you, if you even look at a woman with that, he, oh, he says, it, you heard it said, do this, but I say love your, love your uh, neighbor and don't be angry. To be angry is to commit murder in your heart. What does he do? He doesn't say, oh yeah, we're in the new covenant now, lower the standard. No, he raises the standard. Why? Because mercy and grace are in us now. So we should be empowered and walking in generosity. Okay? He doesn't say, oh, yeah, good, good job. Now you don't have to do anything. And that's the problem is in America, we've heard a responsible, responsibility less. There's no responsibility in our Christians anymore. There's no responsibility. We've, all, we've turned it into that's the pastor's job. The pastor can do it. He'll do it for me. That's not how it works. When we're followers, it means we practice the way that Jesus lived, which is generosity. Are we tracking? Yeah. Okay, we could get fully into it, but we're going to go one thing. Luke eleven thirty seven. 37, right? Tithe is not the mountaintop of Christian generosity. We need to understand that. Okay, everybody hearing me? Yeah. This can set you free, guys. Like, I'm telling you, you're like, oh, another money. It's, this can set you free by giving yourself away. Tithe is the starting line of generosity. It's not the mountaintop. We've turned it into, oh man, that person tithes. They're like, wow. 
It's elementary. It's not collegiate. It's elementary. It's foundational. It's like the, like, here's the first steps of becoming a generous person. Tithe. Here's what they did in Israel. When they had a field, because we're talking about people who are mostly farmers. How many of you guys are farmers? In America, there's 2% of our people are farmers now. A hundred years ago, 98% were farmers. Crazy. Okay? So in farming, farming tithing, what they would do is they would leave the whole field, they would harvest the first fruits, and they would leave the outskirts of the whole field left for the poor. But they would take their first fruits in and tithe off of it, and then they would leave almost an extra 12% left on the field for others to grab hold of. Tithe is elementary. It's the beginning. The rest is the overflow. That's the offering. That's the giving above what you tithe. Okay, is this helping anybody? You're like, I don't know what tithe is. I don't know what offering is. Tithing is your 10%. The other is the outskirts of the field. It's I gave my tithe and now you have need. Oh, good, I have extra. You're, and you're sitting in the stream, you're like, well, that's great for you, Ethan. I don't have extra. If you looked at your bank account, you probably do. If we're gonna get really real, if, if we Dave Ramsey this thing, <laughs> If we totally money, total money makeover this puppy, if we realize how much we spend on things we do not need, yeah. well, I, I get, well, I just don't have the money. Well, you just like Netflix too much. <laughs> I just like Starbucks too much. Like, dude, I'm telling you, when we, Lydia and I took on this, like, we are going to pay off our house, and we stopped buying Starbucks, we were like, look at all this money. <laughs> we were spending so much money on Starbucks. And baking Gouda sandwiches. So, like, I'm not talking about from someone who's, like, not looked at this. Like, if I look at my Netflix subscription, my Disney Plus subscription, my Amazon, how much I spend on Amazon, all the things I don't need, my new shoes. But, Ethan, I need those things. I'm totally, I promise you, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. This is like, if we don't just have honest conversation, we got to get here. So this, check this out, this uh, passage with Jesus. While Jesus was speaking to, to a Pharisee, he asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at this Pharisee's table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. So Jesus didn't wash his hands. And the Lord said to him, and the Lord said to him now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but the inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? Can you imagine, like you invited me over for dinner and I'm like, you fools. Can you imagine, like what do you do in that situation where like you invited them to your dinner table, you're giving them food and he's like, you guys are the worst. You're like, this doesn't sound like Jesus. He's really nice. He's pretty aggressive. <laughs> He's kind and gentle, okay, and meek, okay. But he says, you're, you're greed. You're full of wickedness. You fools. But in 41, he says, but you, he says, Do, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees. For you tithe mint and rue and every herb, but you neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees. That's a second woe. At that table, he said, fool, woe, woe. Yikes, get me out of there. For you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you. For you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. What he's saying is back then, if you touched a grave, you became unclean. He's like, when people get around you, they become unclean. You're upset with me for not washing my hands. People get around you and they're dirty. Why is he saying this? He's saying, you tithe, but the inside of you is doing it for the wrong reasons. He's not saying, don't tithe. He's saying, you tithe, because you're trying to prop yourself up to make yourself feel good, but you don't do it as worship. And because you don't tithe properly, and because you don't give offerings, it's injustice. 
in its lack of love. So what is the opposite of generosity? The opposite of generosity is injustice. Come on. It's the opposite of injustice. Some of you activists in the room, you're like, let's go. He's talking about justice. I'm ready to march. Ready? This is it. When you don't give, it's injustice in the world. Tithe is the beginning step. It's not the end goal. The end goal is someone who is generous. Anne Frank said it this way. You guys know who Anne Frank is? No one has ever become poor by giving. No one has ever become poor by giving. But we like to tell ourselves, like, this, there's a situation with Lydia and I when we were, we were, I was in between jobs. We were making, like, no money. We had, like, $3,000 saved up. Okay, some of you have heard this story before. We, I had, we had no money coming in. We had rent still to pay. We had just us two. We're living on rice and beans and hot sauce and butter. So good. Try it. We lived on that for like a month on just rice, beans, and, and that was it. And, and then there was this moment where Lydia comes to me and she goes, things are not looking good right now. We should tithe more. And it wasn't just tithing more. She was, what she said is it was $1,000, right? $1,000? She's like, let's give $1,000. I'm like, shut up. Like, <laughs> stop making me feel bad for being like, nah, babe. Like, I'm the husband here. I have to protect you and that TV. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So I'm like, no, 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 no. But in this moment, she's like, no, we need to give. And I'm like, we don't have money. There's no money coming in. I'm a terrible car salesman. None of this is coming in. We're not making money. Like, and when we pay our rent, we will have no money. And what happened is we gave faithfully. We were like, Lord, we're just going to give this to you. I don't know what to do because money feels like it's the only thing I want right now. I just want money, Jesus. I need to pay the bills. That's real. Okay, we can't say that that's not real. That's so real. And guess what? Jesus isn't like, hmm, you only want money. He knows you need money. He knows you need money. He knows you need to pay the rent. He knows you need to put food on the table. He says, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. So what we did is we said, okay, Lord, I trust you. Here's more than what you even asked for. And then in a, it was a month or two. I got the job that I have today. I got into a job I shouldn't have gotten with no sales experience, with nothing that I should have. And what happened? By the time our bank account got to zero, the first check came in. And then from that point on, just... What is that? That is not a picture of faithfulness of Ethan. That's a picture of the faithfulness of God. Okay? That is not a picture of, oh, you were so wise, you were so disciplined. It's not. I didn't want to give it. (laughs) I didn't. Like, if you really got down to it, it's like, I, that $1,000 could go pretty far. But we just said, you know what, Lord? I trust you. And we gave it to her parent, my, uh, Lydia's church, her parents' church. It's because it, when we give, we let go. And we grab on to trust. The best thing you can do is trust the Lord. In Luke 16, 10, he says this. This is what Jesus says. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Listen to me. He didn't, Jesus did not say, you shouldn't serve God in money. He didn't say, this is some good advice. You shouldn't do both. He says, you can't. You can't. You are either doing one and despising the other. And so when we don't live generously, we are worshiping ourselves and our money. We are not worshiping God. There is no fence to stand on. It is one or the other. Why is this good news? He's, uh, he's welcoming us into freedom from ourselves. Ooh. 
What does that mean? Money is at odds with God when it's not tithed. Uh Uh-oh. You hearing me? When, When I'm not living generously, my money and my bank account is at odds with him. But when I'm generous and I give to the needs of the church and to the needs of the poor, what happens? My money is partnered with God. And guess what happens when you give God fish and bread? He multiplies it. I didn't give it to him so that he multiplies it. I entrusted it to him, and the natural outcome is fruit, is multiplication, more. That's good news. So here's the deal. Tithing, everybody listen up right here. If you take nothing away, this is all I want you to take away. Tithing gives God you at work. It brings your 40 plus hours of stocking shelves, calling clients, teaching students, baking cakes, raising kids, fixing cars, cutting trees, selling homes, holding scalpels in the operating room, you name it, into a beautiful relational gift of love and connection to God. It brings all of that into connection to him. It says, this is what tithing says, it says, though I may not have been speaking to you at work, I was thinking of you at work. I was doing it for you and I had you in mind. Tithing redeems all the time I spent this week frustrated with neurosurgeons, frustrated with orthopedic surgeons, frustrated with my coworkers, dealing with the stress of life. When I tithe, it redeems all of that And it liberates it from what it could have been as just another hard week of work and I got to go to work on Monday again. And what it does is it ushers in all the grace of who God is. And though I was not speaking to him, I was saying, this is all for you. So now when I come in on a Monday morning, I'm not thinking, another week. I'm thinking, this is for you, Lord. This is for you because at the end of this week, I'm going to tithe to you. And that means this whole thing was for you. Yeah, that's good. Come on. It liberates what you did Monday through Saturday and it offers it up as worship to the Lord. Mm-hmm. If giving makes you nervous, that's good. When you give, you are giving over to God your most nervous and anxious self and entrusting to him to bring you to the joy that comes from following Jesus. You hand over. Some of us are so anxious, not because life is anxious, but because we are carrying our yoke, not his. He says, my yoke is light and it is easy. We get anxious because we don't trust Giving is a form of trust. It's a form of expression of, I trust you with my life. Because if I don't have money, am I going to live in this world? No. Right? You need money. Do you not? We need money in this world. I can't do anything in this world without money. Right? So this message is not money is evil. No. It's money is the opportunity to hand the money back to God and say, this is yours. What do you want to do with it? Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not going to go into this, but the next time I speak, I'm going to speak about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a form of generosity. Okay? Being a generous person doesn't just have to do with your money. It also has to do with giving your forgiveness away. That's why it's forgive. When Jesus said, pray like this, my father who is in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day my daily bread and forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who sin against me or the debts of those, right? Forgive me of my debts, I'll forgive them of their debts. Forgiveness is a form of somebody walking in generosity. So this whole thing is not just about money. If you're tithing, but you have unforgiveness in your life, you're not generous. <laughs> yeah? We're going to get into that the next time I speak.
Okay, so I created this rule of life, um, which a rule of life is essentially it's just the boundaries, right? It's the, it's the goals of where am I going in life? What, what does my money say about me? What does my time say about me? If you've been coming, I spoke about prayer, solitude, spending time with God, purposeful things in life that say this is my life and it is unto the Lord. So I created a rule of life um, and, and wrote this down. It says, in a culture of consumerism, I will be one who finds contentment in Jesus. Through the practice of tithe, offering, and forgiveness, I will participate in the deep joy of God by being a generous person who gives freely away what God first gave me. That's such a good, like, it's such a good thing to just be like, okay, when Lydia asked me again, hey, we should, she did it last month, <laughs> we should give more. I'm like, ah. We already did. She's like, I want to give more. <laughs> Here's the deal. If you're married, anybody married in here? If your spouse says you have to give, always lean on the generous, the g- more generous one. Typically, it's Lydia because she's not working for the money. <laughs> she's like, it's coming in anyways. You got commissions coming. It's fine. Right? Well, I'm like, now you got to book more doctors. <laughs> and that's not what it's, it's, it's leaning into contentment. Right? When we give our money away, it's to say, I'm content with my ordinary life. And when you hear ordinary in America, you think, why? Because advertisers told you to think that way. It's true. Every commercial you've seen, every Kardashian thing you've bought, (laughs) it's told you. (laughs) It's told you ordinary isn't good. It's not good. You need the higher life, right? What Jesus is telling you in giving is to settle into the beauty of your ordinary life. Relax into it. Enjoy it. Right? It's to go fishing with your kids like Scott will today and to look at your kids catching fish and go, my goodness, this is amazing. It's for me to jump on my trampoline with my kids and go, we have everything we need. Right? Okay, all the Kanye people didn't figure that one out. (laughs) Chris got it. Thank you, Chris. I saw you laugh. We have everything we need. It's to just settle into it and be like, man, Jesus just, he, he didn't promise you a Tesla. He didn't even promise you a wealthy life. What he promised you was peace in the midst of the storm. And for us to settle in is op. It's opposite of culture. It's an act of resistance against what culture's doing. It's to just settle into that. And so how do we do this? Again, the question isn't what is it going to cost me if I give? It's what is it going to cost me if I don't become a generous person? The question isn't how much should I give? It's how much has God given me? Don't ask that question. How much should I give? The question you should be asking is, how much has God given me? Okay? So how do we tithe? I'm landing the plane right now. It's fast. This is the habit of how do we tithe? We tithe with special attention to the needs of the church and the needs of the poor. That's how we tithe. With special attention to the needs of the church and to the needs of the poor. That means when you see the poor and you give them money, and so it's just, well, I mean, they're just going to go smoke some, well, they're just going to go drink the, right? If the Lord says give, give. And when you give, it's justice for that person. Just like blind Bartimaeus, it is mercy and grace to that person that you're handing them. It's unmerited favor. It's, you didn't work for this, I worked for this. But guess what? It doesn't even belong to me. It belongs to God. And Jesus said, what did he say? I was naked and you gave me clothes. I was thirsty, you gave me water. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was in prison, you visited me. But the Lord, I didn't, that wasn't you. No, it was me. Come on. So start tithing. Tithe 10% of your tithe. Tithe 10% of your, know, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> tithe 10% of your income and watch what happens. Don't watch your bank account though that might be affected, I'm just saying that could, it has for us, but if you tithe, watch what happens when you give the Lord your anxiety. 
when you give it the Lord, you're like, okay, Lord, I don't need more Starbucks. I don't need more Amazon. I don't need an Apple watch. I am content in you. Watch what happens. Okay. And if you're doing it with the heart of Lord, I, I don't know how to be generous. Some of you, I was, I was born and raised up with a father who, and a mother who gave me this like principle. I watched it play out in their lives, like where they had moments in life where they had no food and they gave their food to a youth group to use as egg, like their only food they had on their, their fridge was eggs. And then their youth pastor was like, hey, do you have any eggs? We want to use it for the spoon thing where like people drop them and it ruins them. And they're like, ah, that's our food for the week. That, that's why I learned from. That's real. I, but some of you, you didn't grow up with people teaching you how to be generous. The Lord will teach you how, okay? It's just handing it over to him and listening to him. So the practical things of, t- of tithing, don't be a consumer of your church. Be a cultivator of your church, okay? You didn't come to consume church. You're not giving to consume church. You're giving to cultivate what the Lord is doing in the church, right? You didn't give because Ethan spoke such a good message, right? You gave because the Lord is calling you to be generous and it's cultivating an environment of the Lord. Yeah? Okay. Get into the habit of giving things away before you buy. When you buy, go, okay, maybe we should give something away. I don't like that one. All of you are like, oh, we're going to go through our closet today, throw out, get rid of all the clothes we don't need anymore. No, like look at the really valuable things. <laughs> like look at what's in your house. You're like, that's just sitting there. Nobody's using it. Who could use it? You know, if it's a bike that has not been ridden for forever and little Timmy's down the road, he could use a bike. Give the bike away. Right? It's just like we, oh man, don't even get me started on statistics of storage units. You know, every American, here we go. Every American in America, if we gave all the, to, all the space that is in storage units in this nation, every single American could have seven square feet of storage of stuff. That's how much stuff we have in our country that we don't need. Most of it just sits, nobody touches it, it's just there. Seven square feet for every single person. That's how much there is. We have a lot. If you make more than $25,000 in this room, you're in the top 1% of the whole world in wealth. You're like, it doesn't feel that way. I understand that. Our economy is the worst right now, right? But like, if you make $25,000, you are in the 1% richest people on the planet right now. Goodness gracious. I don't know whether that's helpful or hurtful to hear. <laughs> You're like, man, America's not that great right now. Um, get into the habit of, of giving things away. Start a budget. It's really hard to give away anything when you're in debt. So those of you who are like, I can't give because I'm in debt. Pay your debt off. God didn't create you to be in debt. Okay? Where are my Dave Ramsey people at? Whoop, whoop. Right? If, if you're like, I just can't give away, I have too many credit card payments. Pay your credit cards off. It's preventing you from ushering in justice and love into the world. Because we can't stop buying things. Okay? Hmm. And forgive people. Be generous with your forgiveness. I think sometimes when people tithe and they're like, nothing happened. I'm like, you probably just haven't forgiven people. Like, that's, that's generous. The most generous people are the people who can forgive. And I'm talking to you as somebody who has been through the gauntlet, where, like, my character has been in question. Like, suspicion and lies and things like that have happened to me. And guess what? Forgive. Jesus was on the cross. They don't even know what they're doing. I forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. How many times have I hurt somebody? I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Come on. How many times have we just hurt people and we, and we don't even know it? We're just... 
Come on. We have to forgive. We have to be generous. Okay. Does this make sense? We're, okay, we're done. You did good. You made it. And you didn't throw anything at me. It's a miracle. Okay? Do you understand that, like, as Christians, the reason why we talk about any of this is because we have to practice our faith. If we don't practice our faith, if it's not moving from here into our bodies, it's not real. It's not. It has to be worked out in you. Literally, it has to come out of you. If it's just theory and belief and theology, it's not real. It has to work its way out of you, okay? So understand, like, I'm not talking about this because I enjoy this. This is my least favorite topic to talk about, but it's one of the most important things for us to grab hold of, okay? Amen. Lord, would you just seal this in our hearts, Lord, to be generous, forgiving people, Lord, full of joy, delight, benevolence, Lord. Um, would you help us to usher in justice, in love, into this, into this city, into this state, Lord, into our families and every relationship. Would you just help us, Lord? Help us to be generous like you are generous. Help us to give like you give. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.